in bigger pockets, blowing Todd Burton, hanging out in bigger pockets, and Jay Hendricks. Like, you're hanging out with these guys, back, patting each other on the back, back and forth. You know, the train wreck that, that has come from Morris um, that we're hearing about anyway, or alleged train wreck. So I, I was thinking about that prior to our talk today is, you know, how did we protect the investor and how did they get, you know, goofed up with the Morris situation? And it was pretty easy that, you know, there was no lender involved. It was all cash and there was no third party taking care of the rehab, making sure that the rehabs got done. And then allegedly, or based on, you know, on online commentary that you see, um, there was a lot of um, folks that never went, never looked, and just blindly trusted what they were being told. And a lot of what they were being told just simply wasn't true. So we were able to um, bring a, a, a big amount of safety net to the, to the out-of-state investor. At the end of the day, they got a rehabbed house. They got a refi done. Very few people paid cash, um, or they wouldn't come to us if they had cash. There was no way to do that. But you know, where where it happened with the Morris is there was no third party like we were the lender, you know, protecting um, the rehab money and making sure the rehabs actually got done. And in those days, like I said, I would go out and vet the turnkey operator, make sure they had property management in place, make sure they had crews that could do the rehab, so on and so forth. I probably did over 2,000 of those loans. That's how I see that. And, and that, that's the thing, right? Like the key takeaway uh, that I got from, you know, what you're saying here is like you specifically, you went out, you vetted these people and, you know, you made sure the rehabs were actually getting done uh, because, you know, there's two sides of the story, obviously. Well, there's, you know, there's two sides and then there's the exact truth. I'm sure not you know, it's a little bit deeper than all of that. But the main thing that a lot of the people uh, that are crying foul, right, they're saying that rehabs actually weren't getting done. And uh, there is a lot of evidence that that is true. Um, but I guess my question is, looking at the bigger picture, industry-wide, moving forward, like you went out and you vetted these turnkey people and you made sure that these rehabs were actually getting done. In all of your years in this business, uh, did you, when you were vetting these people, did you come across turnkey providers that uh, had huge red flags that you denied their business or you said, no, you're trying to run a scam? Like, I'm sure you've run into this before in your long career, yes? Oh, yes, absolutely. And, and normally it wasn't, um, they were out and out um, trying to run a scam. They were just not ready for prime time. So we'd get in two or three deals deep, the rehabs weren't getting done, we couldn't get the refi, and that vendor was turned off, you know, no longer did it. That's, that's the amazing part of what happened in Indianapolis is, you know, it went on for a couple of years and hundreds and hundreds of properties. If those folks have been using a lender, a hard money lender or any kind of lender, that would have, that whole situation would have never got out of control like that. And it's the same thing with, um, you know, West Coast uh, marketing companies, which, uh, you know, we know all the big, you know, turnkey marketing companies, they'll get going with a trusted market specialist or vendor. And all of a sudden, they're not quite ready for, you know, they have uh, blowback or, or bad deals, you'll see that online sometimes, and they'll, they'll just stop working with that vendor. But it never gets out of control. They may have to go in and do damage control on, you know, half a dozen or a dozen properties, but it's never, you know, 500 or a thousand like, you know, we're, we're allegedly hearing about in Indianapolis. Do you find uh, that it to be credible that Clayton was simply an honest working uh, victim right along with the other victims here? Or is that total nonsense? I think it's total nonsense because he went into other markets and he's selling the exact same high risk property. I, I think it's more a greed factor and or an ineptitude factor. He doesn't really know what he's doing. He doesn't realize, I mean, you saw his videos. Oh, D class, C class property, the renters are easier to manage than A class. I mean, anybody in the rental business knows that that's just patently, op it's the opposite is true. <laughs> and, and, and so he's, I mean, I don't, I doubt Waylon came up and told him that and he just believed it. I mean, this is his own, his own marketing. I mean, it's just everything that he would talk about uh, was almost 
directionally opposite of what reality is in the field. The thing, James, is, um, you know, I wouldn't loan on properties that were the worst of the worst, right? Okay. So I go out and I check out the market. So the, the investor back east had me to rely on because I'm, at the end of the day, if they didn't pay me back, who's taking the risk? It's me. So yeah. it wasn't it wasn't the investor, you know. I I mean, it, they just stopped paying. I end up foreclosing on them, but at the end of the day, it was our it was our it's our capital at risk. So you have an alignment of interest. You have the buyer, you have the lender, and the lender is going to. And today we see that in the lending business, they they vet you know the operators pretty hard um, to uh, before they're going to loan money. And in your operations, so you're, you're loaning money on a short-term basis. Uh, so like, you know, those systems are in place because nobody gets paid. You don't get paid if the buyer themselves actually has a reasonable product that they can refinance out through that residential financing. So that's good to have those in place. Uh, through those people that you did cut off, you had stated that, uh, you know, they weren't trying to run scams necessarily, but, you know, they weren't ready for prime time. They weren't you know, totally ready to get into this. So maybe they had good intentions, but like, were you seeing guys that, uh, you know, they just didn't have the infrastructure built up and, and you could foresee it getting out of control. And is there anyone specifically that you'd care to speak to that you did shut off very early who later on went to build up something a little bit bigger on their own that is similar to what we're seeing today with what happened in Indianapolis? Uh, not really. The guy, the guys that I, I shut off back, you know, we're talking 10, 12, 15 years ago. I, I, I don't even remember who they are, most of them. And it was so short lived. Um, I don't really know any of them that have gone on. Um, I do know of one that's all public record that I can speak to where I never got started with them. They, they came to visit me in Oregon and laid out their business model. And I just told them, you're, you know, this is, you're going to fail. And why? Why business, were they going to fail? Because they were buying the cheapest property, the okay. cheapest property, just like Morris did, buying five, ten thousand dollar houses. So we know those are those are the roughest, toughest neighborhoods, hardest to sustain um, rental income on. And then they were setting up um, their their background. The guys that were setting the program up, their background was financial advisors and annuity salesmen. So they were trying to bring the annuity business to the real estate space and they were going, they were attacking their um, clients that were, you know, in wealth management situations with financial advisors and trying to bring a real estate product uh, that was like an annuity. So they would sell it as a, almost like a security and, you know, we'll, we'll guarantee the rents for two years. We'll handle everything. We'll do it all. And you just have to put the money up. Well, if you know anything about, which you do, uh, D-class property, F-class, D-class, low C-class, it's anything but um, sustainable um, cash flow. You know, some will go fine, but you can have three that, you know, you have turnover four times a year or three times a year. So their cash flow, um, they just ran out of cash based on having to guarantee rents for so long and maintenance. For, so they just did all these big guarantees. And then what happens, they started uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, they raised a lot of money for, um, you know, other types of situations that that money went to try to plug the hole of the people that they had promised to pay payments to. Uh, long story short, um, indictments and jail. And the, the, the mastermind of that was a guy named Chad Ducher and his company was called Marquise um, Properties and they were located out of Utah. And um, so, I mean, that one I followed and I, I didn't, I wouldn't fund into what he, he was doing because I knew it wasn't viable. It wasn't sustainable. <clears throat> so he, this actually, it went from simil, civil to, to being criminal. I assume like what were the, the actual charges? Probably wire fraud, something of that nature or? It's, it's always wire fraud, and a lot of people don't understand what wire fraud is. Wire fraud is also the dissemination of false information. So if you have um, a turnkey operator saying, we are going to do this, and we're going to do that, and we represent we're going to do this, and it's all false, that's, that's wire fraud. It doesn't have to be money. It can be information as well. 
So with that point then, um, because, you know, that's really a big, you know, cusp of everybody who's crying foul on the Morris situation. Uh, do you believe that uh, this Morris situation, all the stuff that happened in Indianapolis, do you, in your expert opinion, do you think it's possible that we could eventually go down a wire fraud uh, path? Because a lot of uh, the marketing that was done by Morris Invest, um, it, to, to me, the message because like right now, his biggest defense is, hey, I was duped by Burt Whalen and Ocean Point. I promoted properties. I showed you guys the properties. And then I passed you on to Ocean Point. But then we're seeing evidence that Morris actually signed purchase agreements himself. And, you know, he promoted his three-step process. So with all of that in mind, his defense right now seems to be counter counteractive of uh, what his message was. Do, do you foresee uh, a chance of going down the wire fraud, uh, wire fraud pathway here? Well, yeah, I, I mean, for sure. You can't have hundreds of people that have lost, you know, significant sums and some that have um, lost entire life savings or retirement accounts. I mean, they're, and a lot of it is, is they paid for rehab that never got done. I mean, that's just out now fraud. So, whether Morris took the money in or Whalen took the money in, the problem is, is there, there wasn't a, a definition of roles. Um, it's not like a real estate broker, you know, make it clearly defining them as a, a commission and you have a seller and you, you know, he didn't, he didn't market himself as a, a broker or a, a middleman. He marketed himself as, oh, I bought one of those Morris houses. Everybody that got online is I bought a house from Morris. And you see, um, you know, evidence of that in the pleadings where, you know, it was an alter ego of Ocean Point. And um, so, yeah, I, I think if, if they want to wrap everybody into that, it's, it's you know, it, it's highly likely that something like that could happen. Really depends on, um, you know, the, the state regulators, whether they want to, you know, put the time and effort in, into doing that. Um, you know, one way, and, you know, we've talked about this, you know, you either, if you're going to sell property you don't own, you need to be licensed. So you either have a massive amount of, you know, real estate brokerage violations, <laughs> you know, taking fees. So you can't have it one way or the other. I mean, he was clearly out there selling real estate and I think it's been demonstrated he has no real estate license. So That, that is correct. I, I spoke to Maura, uh, Clayton himself for a couple hours um, and uh, yes, he does not have a license in any of the 50 states. Right. Uh, his wife does have a license, but that was in New Jersey. So she was not, uh, you know, they weren't using her license and she wasn't acting as a person selling it. Um, to that point, specifically speaking, right? Uh, so I, I talked to Clayton about this because Clayton, you know, he did bring up a, a couple of interesting points, uh, which will be, you know, people will be highlighted in other parts of this video. Um, but some of the points that Clayton brought up were interesting. But one of the points that I wanted to keep hammering uh, to Clayton during our conversation and that he really appeared to have no uh, way to back himself out of that corner was the fact that, uh, okay, if you don't own this real estate, if it's actually Ocean's Point, it's Ocean Point's real estate, uh, you are acting as a real estate broker. I asked him if he was worried about getting in trouble with the Indianapolis Division of Real Estate. Um, at one point, because there are, there are contracts out there that Clayton has actually signed as the seller. Clayton's story is that uh, at one point, he negotiated with Ocean Point and Burt Whalen to actually become a part owner of Ocean Point, to be a part owner of that entity so he could do that. Uh, and at one point, Clayton was under the impression he was an owner of Ocean Point, uh, but that never got finalized, and then he aborted. So in this situation, it, it appears he's going to have to admit one or the other. He's going to have to admit that he brokered several million dollars worth of real estate without a license, which is very punishable, or mm -hmm. he's going to have to admit uh, to being an undisclosed agent and also admit to being the person that sold uh, these fraudulent houses. So he's well, going to have to admit to one of them. Yeah, he's, he's an undisclosed principal. He's an undisclosed agent. I mean, there, there's all sorts of problems with his, his defense. And, and it'll go, you know, in a deposition, it would just go, were you lying then or are you lying now? I mean, 
there's he has no way out of that. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.